Intel's efficiency cores actually make any difference for gaming? Depending on who you ask, it can be a fantastic thing because more cores is always better, it's going to mean that your game is going to run even smoother, and yet at the same time, dig a little bit deeper and you'll see that there are some people that suggest turning the e-cores off. And in fact, in this gaming computer we have right here, there is actually a gaming mode that disables all of the e-cores. But I thought more cores was better, so why would you want to turn them off? Throughout this video, we're going to be answering that very question as we do some gaming tests with the efficiency cores enabled, disabled, and quite a nice blend actually to see exactly how many you need, if any, and whether there is a sweet spot for getting the ultimate gaming performance from your Intel gaming PC. It's certainly going to be an interesting one, so stay tuned to learn everything you need to know right after a short word from this video's sponsor. Corsair's brand new 2500 series of cases has arrived, proving serious airflow can come in small sizes. This MATX enclosure fits huge graphics cards and coolers, and thanks to its dual chamber design, building is a breeze. I've even equipped mine with Corsair's new IQ RX fans, which comes with new magnetic dome bearings for quieter acoustics, and Corsair's air guide technology for more directed airflow. Learn more today with the link down below. To properly kick things off, I first think we need to actually discuss what an E-Core actually is. Well, it stands for efficiency, and you might be thinking, in a gaming CPU, why would you want efficiency? Surely you want the best performance possible. And I think the question most of us had when these were originally launched uh, with the 12th generation series of Intel CPUs was, well, we don't really want that. We want like 20 cores that have maximum performance. We don't want to have all of these smaller things on there. But actually, when you think about it, it does make perfect sense because we have to think about constraints. Boring word, I know, but when you're building a CPU in order to actually physically fit it on the die and in order to be able to provide it with enough power without the whole thing melting and overheating, you do have to cut things back a little bit. And the way that Intel went about that generation was to think, well, for gaming, you only really need six or eight cores, and then everything else is kind of a little bit of a waste. Whereas for multi-threaded applications, for productivity, more cores is usually better. So what they did was to essentially combine the two, which is why you have that combination of performance cores and efficiency cores. Efficiency cores don't use as much power, and they are physically smaller, so you can actually fit more on the CPU itself. So in theory then, this is fantastic, because you're essentially cramming as much power as possible into a smaller space, you're just doing it in a slightly different way to the AMD approach. But where things get a little bit more complicated is understanding how the games or the tasks themselves should use this hardware, because what happens if you have like a command that needs to be run on a performance core, but then it goes to an efficiency. In a game, that could mean an FPS drop, a stutter, or maybe at worst, it could be latency issues, could cause a crash, who knows? But actually, I've got to say, in my experience at least, I've found that the Intel Thread Director system to work really well. But working really well doesn't mean it's flawless. So what happens if you don't have those efficiency cores? Is your game going to run better or is it going to be worse? To properly test this then, we need to mash that delete key and go into the BIOS and actually make some tweaks because what we're going to do is use our test system that has an RTX 4090 GPU and then a 14700K Intel CPU. And we're going to start by disabling a load of the cores. So we're actually going to run this with six performance cores rather than the eight normal and we're going to run it with two efficiency. We're then going to compare that with eight cores which are performance and not efficiency and this should sort of give us an indication of how different the efficiency cores are to the performance cores. They're then we're going to start cranking up all of the efficiency cores to see whether having those extra performance cores on top of those eight CPU cores actually makes a difference. Certainly was a mouthful, but I think the results should be interesting. And if you do want to follow along at home, it is actually very straightforward. Your motherboard BIOS may well look different to this. This is a Gigabyte Aorus board, but you just need to go into the BIOS, go into the advanced mode and then find where it says tweaker and you should have advanced CPU settings. Loads of different things you can tweak, but actually here we're not going to change anything other than the core count. When we actually did our like CPU cores for gaming, I wanted to keep everything very consistent, but one of the potential advantages you might get by disabling the efficiency cores is maybe that your performance cores can run more power efficiently, so you can actually get more performance out of them as they will essentially overclock themselves. We're gonna leave everything on automatic, so we'll see how intelligent this motherboard is. The setting we want is all the way down the bottom, I believe. CPU cores enabling mode. Not fantastic English, but it works. Uh, so here we are going to turn our P core off 
for core seven and core six. If you're wondering why seven, not eight, is because one of the cores is called P0, because it's in an array. Computer science. Then we're gonna turn 10 of the other 12 efficiency cores off. And if we go over to our CPU, we should see we have a total of eight cores. But again, remember, two of them are efficiency. And I know you might be watching this thinking, that's stupid, that's not real world, why would you do that? Again, we want to compare that with the two efficiency to the true eight core performance and see if we get any differences, because that will be caused by those efficiency cores. And to properly kick off our testing, I think we're going to start with some Spider-Man Remastered, because this is such a heavy game on the CPU. And when we tested this in our CPU cores video, we actually saw quite a big difference for both speed and core count. So if there are going to be any differences, you'd like to think this will be one of the titles that will actually highlight it. And at the moment, at 1440p, as all of our games will be, we're getting around about 130 to 140 FPS and this is with ray tracing enabled as well because not everyone actually realizes that ray tracing while it's incredibly heavy on the GPU it is also very heavy on the CPU as well so you're going to need a decent processor to get it to run. The next game we're going to be testing is pretty dark literally this is some Alan Wake 2 this was a fantastic game really enjoyed it but this is one of the the most intense games I think we actually have, if not the most intense game, because again, this is running with ray tracing, but I'm fairly sure this is like full path tracing actually, when you have it at the highest quality settings. And we're running this without DLSS 3 frame gen that I'd probably use normally, but as you can see, 4090 does do a very good job of running this, as we're currently getting around about 96 FPS. And I would also like to say, bearing in mind this in theory should be the lowest frame rate that we're going to get because it's got that weird combination of cores, I think it does go to show just how strong the single core performance is of this 14700K. Another interesting game, of course, that we simply have to test is one of my personal favorites. This is Returnal. Once again, this is running with DLSS quality, but this is another ray trace title. So this is quite a good example, actually, of something that you might be able to run if you have like a lighter PC. But then as soon as you want to access like those really high-end settings, you are going to need a better CPU and definitely a better graphics card for the ray tracing, but it's all relevant and it has a really nice scientific benchmark too. Our penultimate game is also running along a similar vein. This is being hit by a car simulator, also known as Cyberpunk 2077. And I won't say this is running at absolute max because technically that would be path tracing, but you're not really going to get like a frame rate, I think, that will make any difference to the CPU. So instead, we've got this running at RT Ultra, and as you can see, we're getting around about 100 frames a second at 1440p. I mean, again, you could boost this by enabling like DLSS frame gen or turning the DLSS down from quality, something like that. See, I told you, look, it happens all the time. I, I don't know why. Yeah, obviously you can mess around with the settings, but again, just trying to keep everything consistent, but still sort of maintaining that high-end performance because if you are running a rig like this, you're not gonna wanna turn the settings down. So let's keep this as real world as possible. But I know, I know, I can hear you now. Those are all single player games. I'm a multiplayer person. This video is rubbish. All right, how about we fire up a multiplayer game and we do some tests here with Fortnite and it's obviously always a little bit harder with multiplayer because there's a lot more variables but just to give you an idea of the frame rate we're getting this is max settings without any lumen or ray tracing so those are settings you just wouldn't want to use uh, when you're trying to get as many frames as possible in multiplayer at 1440p and once again we're getting a pretty high frame rate but not as high as something you might maybe expect to get in some other titles things like Apex you would be getting like 300 fps Fortnite around about 150. So this could actually be a limitation or at least a misconfiguration from the layout that we have our CPU running at at the moment. Because I think I would expect a slightly higher frame rate, but then again, our GPU utilization is around about 96. So that doesn't indicate any bottlenecking, but CPU, we're using 50% of it. So it's gonna be interesting. Let's get this thing turned off again and then enable those performance cores. So as we did before, advanced CPU settings, then all E cores disabled, and then all P cores enabled. And this is another one of those opportunities to show your PC gaming prowess or smarts and get your bets in without cheating down below. Will this configuration of eight performance cores actually be in real life the combination of six performance and two efficiency? My money's on yes, but what do you think? Please don't crash. Please don't crash. Why? That, that's problematic, that is. Okay, we're fine apparently, just a dodgy save. Okay, numbers are in, 140 frames a second with a low of 89. And I can reveal that our previous test, we also got a low of 89, but we've gone up in frame rate ever so slightly. Uh, we've gone from 137 to 140. 
So not exactly a huge difference, is it? Bearing in mind that some people would have thought this would be the best of the best. If it is the best, it's not really gonna be any different to the rest of the group. I really am gonna be fascinated though to actually test what happens when we have more cores because look at that utilization, around about 78, 80% on an eight core chip. There are very few games that actually do this. So this is gonna be fascinating. What about one of our more scientific tests though with some Returnal? Obviously the benchmark is exactly the same every time, so should be more accurate. We've now got 177 FPS, which is higher than what we had before 173. So definitely a difference, but if you were sort of choosing between different CPUs, would you really care between 173 and 177? Maybe, but it's certainly not gonna be the end of the world, is it? But those are our single player games. What about the multiplayer, some Fortnite? Is that gonna make a difference? 181, 116. Pretty much the same story as everything else. A very slight increase of three frames a second and essentially the same 1% lows. But okay, maybe you're not gonna get a huge performance difference with eight performance cores, but what happens when you enable the extra efficiency? We're now moving on to our next test, which is eight performance, four efficiency. We've run some Alan Wake, we've done the benchmark, and I'm really pleased to say that the difference we have between these two was basically nothing. In fact, it actually went down ever so slightly by one FPS. Essentially, Alan Wake 2 seems to perform, so far at least, uh, the same across all of our configurations. And I know what you're thinking, well, clearly this is just a GPU bottleneck game, not CPU, it's not a fair test. But don't forget this is also running at 1440p. As I say, it is quite highly dependent on the CPU as well. If we put like an i3 in this, we would not be getting the same frame rate. Uh, but I do also want to address the fact that Efficiency cores aren't necessarily just for increasing frame rate. In fact, in a way, they are actually designed for quite the opposite, which is to enable your game to run like this on those performance cores, uh, but then actually have background tasks running as well. So, you know, RGB software. I mean, I'm not saying that's gonna make a massive difference to your PC, but if you're running like a four core, potentially that could lower your frame rate. Realistically, it's if you wanna have loads of different applications open at the same time whilst you're gaming, you could run into a potential issue. And this is where efficiency cores can certainly help in the background. But I think there will be some games that will benefit from extra efficiency cores. And the only way to test this is for me to spend like the next couple of hours benchmarking. But for you, I will have the pleasure of handing you over to the one, the only, Benchmarkers. All right, governor, how's it going? This is Benchmarkers up and down an old British pub. And I'm here to give you some very serious results. And actually, I would say that these are interesting, but there's not really a dramatic difference in any of the tests. I think it's fair to say that we did see this coming, or at least I certainly did. But there definitely are some differences and it is gonna be on a game by game basis. Remember of course that these are all at 1440p so you're gonna see more dramatic differences at 1080 and arguably even less of a difference at higher resolutions like 4K. But regardless of what it is that you're playing or the resolution, obviously it's gonna be more down to whether your CPU bottlenecks or GPU bottlenecks. And this is why it's on such a strong game by game basis. So Spider-Man Remastered, you probably see the biggest difference. I'd say that 146 average is very different to 137 on paper, but still, whether you'd actually notice a difference playing these games, I'm not really so sure, to be honest with you. And when we average everything else, there's barely anything in it whatsoever. It's quite clear, actually, that having eight performance cores is better than six performance cores and two efficiency, but whether this is worth all of the extra money for, say, like an i7 over an i5, still probably not, but it does show you that you get more performance if you are willing to spend the money. But are efficiency cores worth it? Not really for gaming, but you can use them for so many other things, even if it's just unpacking games or pre-compiling textures. There definitely are uses for them, but turning them off for extra performance, at least in the games we've tested, I wouldn't recommend it. Well, well, well then everybody, what did you make of those results? I've got to admit, I didn't quite expect the performance difference in the games that can actually scale with core count, because whilst these are the efficiency cores, they do actually help out in certain titles, and that's not something I necessarily saw coming. I did think we'd potentially get a little bit of a boost in our like all efficiency cores disabled, eight performance cores, but I guess it's nice to see that that's not the case because most people are gonna be using these chips stock. 
So it's good to see that actually stock is pretty much the best way to go. There's not really any reason to turn these cores off unless you have a specific scenario. And this would typically be your unoptimized game, maybe something that's new out. I think Hogwarts Legacy was one of these titles on launch. And obviously having a mess around can get you a smoother experience. But it's all about optimization for the software, really. And it's great to see that Intel's Thread Director clearly does work really well. I mean, I would also advise that you run Windows 11 for best results, because I know that there's more optimizations within Windows 11 versus Windows 10 to get all of this to work properly. But it's great to see that essentially it does. And if you're watching this and you were wondering whether it's worth turning your efficiency cores off, the answer is no. And don't forget as well that when it comes to like game install speeds, like caching, preloading, anything really that does actually use that CPU, having more of those efficiency cores is going to make that faster as well. So if you've got them turned off and you don't have a reason to turn them off, maybe it's time to turn them back on. But the question very much goes out to you guys on this one. Did you see this coming or is this pretty much business as usual? Let us know down in the comment section below. Smash the like button if you've enjoyed this, get yourself subscribed, and if you do want to check out current pricing on anything that was featured in this video, then as always you can find that link down below with our affiliate links. And while you're down there, why not bask in the greatness of Corsair's 2500 series of cases? This stunning new chassis takes your build to the next level. With support for calling at the top, bottom, rear and side, in addition to showing your PC parts in the best light. You can even pair it with Corsair's new IQ RX fans. For seamless cable management thanks to IQ Link, with awesome acoustic and thermal performance in both RGB and solid flavours. Upgrade today with the link down below. But thank you so much for watching this video, we'll catch you in the next one.